ان الحمد لله نحمد ونستعين ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله Indeed all praise is due to Allah and as such we should praise him seek his help and seek refuge in Allah from the evil which is within ourselves and the evil which results from our deeds for whomsoever Allah has guided none can misguide and whomsoever Allah has allowed to go astray none can guide and i bear witness that there's no god worthy of worship but Allah and that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the last messenger of Allah inna asdaq al hadith kitab Allah indeed the most truthful form of speech is the book of Allah wa khayra hadi hadi Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the best source of guidance was the guidance brought by Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam wa sharr al umuri muhdathatuha and the worst of all affairs are the innovations in religion fa inna kull muhdathatin bid'ah indeed every innovation in religion is a cursed innovation bid'ah وَكُلَّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالَةٍ And every innovation in religion, cursed as it is, is a source of misguidance. وَكُلَّ ضَلَالَةٍ فِي النَّارِ And all misguidance ultimately leads to the hellfire. Brothers and sisters, <clears throat> today we continue our series looking at the pillars of Islam and Iman but from a moral perspective as we said when we began the series looking at the pillars of Islam prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam summarized the essence of the religion from its beginning to its end as a moral message when he said inna ma bu'ithtu li utammima makarim al akhlaq indeed i was sent only to perfect for you the highest of moral character traits and when aisha his wife radiyallahu anha was asked what was the prophet's character like how was his moral character she said kana khuluquhu al quran his character was the quran all of the mat- the moral attributes which he displayed they were manifestations of the message of the quran he implemented those messages the messages of revelation in his day to day life in the way that he dealt with his existence the way that he dealt with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way he dealt with his family with his children with his neighbors with his enemies in the court on the battlefield during hajj in his prayers and how he dealt with the creatures around him in the society how he treated the animals that he rode the animals which he had slaughtered for food or for religious rites all of this 
was a display of the moral character engendered or taught by the Quran itself. And this was the Sunnah. The Sunnah was the translation of the Quran into living practice. So the Sunnah is a living Sunnah. It represents a way of life. Fundamentally, a moral way of life. This is what Islam is. It is a moral message. Essentially, it is a moral message. To implement that message, it might require weapons. So there is jihad. Jihad is a place. But ultimately, the goal of jihad is not the spilling of blood. The goal of jihad is not primarily to take the lands of other people. Though it may come as a part of the jihad, people's lands and their properties may be taken. But that isn't the goal. That is just the consequence of military struggle. The losers have to be dealt with. And they are dealt with in accordance with principles which Islam has set down. Principles which are fundamentally moral principles. We find them written up now in the Geneva Convention. It is only in the 20th century that the West of the world decided to put laws for war. Whereas Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in translating the Quran established the laws for war 1,400 years ago. They established the moral principles which must be upheld even in the time of battle. So, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, conveyed to us a moral message. And everything of Islam is geared towards creating an ideal moral individual. That is the individual who can change his world, the world in which he lives, the environment in which he exists. If he himself is changed, he follows that moral message, the guidelines, the blueprint of Prophet Muhammad wasallam, then he will be able to change his family, his community, his society, his nation, and the world. Ultimately, he will be a part of that change. Maybe he's not the one who will ultimately make final decisions with regards to government policies, etc., etc. But he is a part of that change. And that change begins with the individual. So when we look at the pillars of Islam, as we did, in the previous khutbas. We looked at each pillar, one after the other, to extract from each one of them the moral message which is in it with regards to our character. What should be our character with regards to salah, fasting, Hajj, Zakah, the Shahadatan, there was and there is and there will be, continue to be a moral message that each and every one of us needs to learn. And whatever we learn of Islam, whether it is from Islamic history, it is a statement of the Prophet Muhammad in a hadith, or it is from any of the uh, relationships which Islam establishes, economic, social, etc. Each and every instruction, each and every 
bit or piece of information carries with it a moral message. Meaning, there is something in it for us to apply in our daily lives. And that's what we need to know. Because knowledge which we don't apply becomes useless knowledge. And Prophet Muhammad وسلم, used to say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min ilmin la yanfa'. O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from knowledge which is of no benefit. Now that knowledge which is of no benefit could be useless knowledge in the sense that it's false knowledge. Or it could be useful knowledge and beneficial knowledge, but we just don't apply it. It could go either way. So, to protect ourselves from falling into that evil category, the evil category for which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, or taught us in our daily prayers to say, اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ الصِّرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَضَالِينَ Show us the straight path. This is what we ask for 17 times every day, at least. Show us the straight path. Most important thing to ask for in this life. Straight path is what? That moral path. Where we do the right thing. We make the right decisions. We ask for that. And then Allah goes on to clarify who is on that path. Sirat al and Amta alayhim. Those, the path of those who you have blessed. They live blessed lives. So that's what we are seeking. Ghair al maghdubi alayhim. And not the path of those on who is your wrath. Who are they? They are those who have knowledge which they don't apply. The prime example is that of the Jews, who receive the knowledge. They know what that knowledge, that message was, but they didn't apply it. And not the path of those who have gone astray, due to what? Ignorance. Not having knowledge at all. Following misguidance. And the classical example of them today are the Christians who follow a religion, not the religion which Prophet Jesus brought, but a religion which was fabricated after his time. So the very things that he spoke out against, they promoted. And the very things that he did, they didn't do. He called them to the worship of one God, and they called people to the worship of him. Calling him the one God. He worshipped one God, and it is recorded in their distorted gospel that he did falling down on his face, as we do in sujood. He worshipped the one God. But today, the mass of Christians worship Jesus. How farther astray could one possibly get? So we ask Allah to protect us from that. And as Prophet ﷺ had said, طَلَبُ الْعِلْمِ فَرِيدَ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمْ Seeking knowledge is compulsory for every Muslim. And that's why he made it a religious obligation on us. That each and every Muslim should know his or her religion. Not enough for us to say I'm Muslim because my parents are Muslims. It's not enough. Because Allah will not reward us for our parents' Islam. He will question us for what we did. They get their reward for what they did, and we will get for what we do. So moving on, 
having completed the five pillars of Islam, we now move on to the six pillars of Iman. They are belief in Allah, belief in His angels, belief in His books, belief in the messengers, belief in the last day, and belief in destiny. These six pillars which constitute the pillars of faith, the foundation of Muslim belief, were identified 1,400 years ago. They are not pillars which people agreed upon after Prophet Muhammad Wasallam's death where there were discussions and people had meetings and eventually they came up with these six. No. Like the five, they were taught by Prophet Muhammad Wasallam in his own lifetime. And that is what unites Muslims throughout the world. And that is what holds Islam intact and will continue to hold it until the last day. So the first of the pillars of faith, belief in Allah. Belief in Allah. What does it mean? First and foremost, it means belief in Allah's existence. Belief in Allah's existence. Belief meaning having certain belief. A belief which is free from doubt. A belief which a person feels confident about. There are people today who would promote the idea that belief in Allah is illogical. It's blind faith that everything actually points to there being no God. However, one should be certain that belief in Allah, belief in God's existence is logical. It is reasonable. And in fact, it is the disbelief in Allah's existence which is illogical. Which is, bla is, which is based on blind faith. Belief in God's existence was held by the founders of logic. The Greeks, ancient Greeks, Plato and Aristotle, leading thinkers amongst the Greeks who are who are revered, virtually worshipped by Western civilization, they argued logically for the existence of God. Logically. Using pure logic, they argued there must be a God. So we ask those who say it is illogical to believe in God, what happened with Aristotle and Plato? the founders of your logic. So, we should have no doubt that what is proposed by others, that this existence that we live in is a pure, a pure result of accident, this is illogic. It goes against all of our mental processes when a person walks on the beach and he or she sees a footprint in the sand what comes to mind logically if we think in terms of those who say belief in God is illogical belief in accident as being the creator is more logical. 
then we have to say that when you see that footprint in the sand, the first thing that should come to the logical mind is that the waves came up onto the sand, sunk into the sand, and formed a footprint. But who thinks that? No one thinks that. Whenever, whenever we see a footprint in the sand, we say, somebody was walking here. That footprint indicated, that is logical thinking, that somebody made that footprint. It didn't happen by accident. Though, it is not absolutely impossible that the seawater could sink into the sand and form something looking like the shape of a footprint. It's not impossible. But that is not what comes to our mind. So those who claim the whole of this existence is a, world, is a result of an accident, that is what they're trying to say. And we say, okay, if there is one footprint, a result of an accident, how about all the footprints? No. Even if we accept that one footprint could be the result of an accident, consistently every time we see a footprint that's going to come to our mind? No. And that's what they're saying. Illogical. The whole of this existence is a result of an accident. Chance. No designer. Design was a product of accident. The second part of belief in God or belief in Allah is to believe that Allah alone is the Lord of this world. The Lord of all that takes place. He controls, He sustains, He maintains, these attributes are his. Whatever takes place in this world is by his permission. Nothing takes place without his permission. Whether good or evil. Whether good or evil. It is by Allah's permission. Very important, basic concept related to belief in Allah. Because this aspect of the belief is what keeps faith firm. One who doesn't have this aspect of belief in Allah clear, easily falls into disbelief whenever calamities occur in their lives, which they cannot explain. This is common. When you sit and you talk to most people who are atheists, why did you become an atheist? Your parents weren't. They will tell you something happened in their life which showed them there couldn't be a God. What could possibly happen? Calamity. Calamity to those who they felt it shouldn't happen to. They will tell you, my aunt, she was a wonderful woman, always doing good for everybody around her. Then one day she was walking across the street and a bus came and just killed her. Why? She was a good person. There are other people around who are evil. My uncles, other relatives, evil. But they lived comfortable lives. They didn't suffer what she suffered. How could there be a God? Where is the justice here? So a person falls into disbelief because of it. And I remember years ago, 
when there was an outbreak of hoof and mouth disease in uh, England and they had this picture of a little girl who had a plaque in front of her and she had some places which were circled and she said the arrows pointing to it saying these are my tears her tears and she had a question. She was standing there with this placard. Her parents were standing behind her. She was asking, God, why did you take my calf? They were killing because, of course, hoof and mouth disease is, or it was the, uh, what's that other, uh, huh? mad cow, mad cow disease which had spread, they were killing the animals, right? Left and right to get rid of them to stop this disease from spreading. So, she had a calf. She was living on a farm. Calf was born. She became attached to it from its very small. It grows up with her, you know. And she's so attached to it. And then they came, took it away and killed it. Something very dear, touching, that she had this relationship with. Killed. So she's asking, God, why did you take away my calf? What was his sin? What did he do? I loved him so dearly. Parents had no answer. Just standing behind. That is the beginning of disbelief. Not being able to understand that Whatever happens in this life, which Allah permits, is for good. Even if we can't see the good in it. Whatever happens in this life, in our lives, in the lives of those around us, is for good. Even if we cannot see the good in it. Many times we can see the good and we say, oh, mashallah, that thing which happened and I was upset about, I see some good came from it, so I say, ah, alhamdulillah, it was a good thing after all. This happens all the time. But there are times when things happen where we can't see the good in it. And this is the time when our faith is tested. And that is part of belief in Allah. To believe that whatever takes place in this world is ultimately for good. Satan! People ask, why did God create Satan? Didn't he know before he created him that Satan would refuse to bow and would tempt Adam and Eve to disobey Allah and eat from the tree. What can you say? If you say no, then you're saying Allah doesn't know all things. Of course he knew. So why then would Allah create this being who would become evil? He didn't create him evil. He would become evil and cause evil knowing that this is going to take place why would he do that because from satan's evil came great good what was the great good the great good was that when adam and eve ate from the tree in disobedience to God and they recognized their sin and they turned back to Allah based on the words of repentance which Allah told them that repentance was one of the greatest acts of worship that we as human beings can do 
turning back to Allah in repentance is among the greatest acts of worship that we can do. Prophet Muhammad said, At-ta'ibu min al-dhambi kaman la dhambala. One who repents from sin is like one without sin. I ask Allah to forgive myself and yourselves, to cause our hearts to turn back to you, O Allah, in repentance, as only you can forgive our sin. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين من كل ذنب فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله all praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. Belief in Allah also involves belief that He alone deserves our worship. That Allah alone deserves our worship. إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ you alone do we worship and from you alone do we seek help. That is the central principle of faith that is required of us in belief in Allah. And this was the essence of the messages of all of the prophets of Allah calling people to the worship of Allah to dedicating their lives to Allah to living God-fearing lives lives in which we are conscious of Allah in each and everything that we do because for a Muslim, all of his or her life is supposed to be worship. From the time that we get up in the morning till the time we go back to sleep at night, playing with our children, relating with our husbands and wives, feeding our animals, working, Interacting socially with our neighbors. All aspects of our lives is supposed to be worship of Allah. As Allah said, قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Say, indeed, my prayers, my sacrifices, my living and my dying are for Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. That is the life of the believer, of a true Muslim, one who has submitted his or her will to Allah. Meaning that in whatever we do, we try to understand what it is that Allah has required of us in this act. This thought, this word. What is it that Allah wants from us? If we do that, then we turn our lives into worship. Prophet Muhammad gave us no end of supplications to make from the time we wake up in the morning till the time we go to sleep at night. Why? All these supplications, when you look at yourself in the mirror, when you go into the bathroom, when you go to eat, when you leave your house, when you enter your job, when you, and so on and so forth, throughout your day, Prophet Muhammad has given us 
supplications, prayers to make for each and every occasion of our lives. Why? In order that we be conscious of Allah in the things that we do. As Allah said, أَقِمِ الصَّلَاةِ لِذِكْرِي Establish the prayer for my remembrance. The essence, a life of prayer, is a life of remembrance of God. And that makes the difference. That distinguishes between the righteous and the unrighteous. So in closing, what are the personality traits? What are the characteristics which belief in Allah should produce in us? What is the fruit of this belief? The fruit which is seen in the life of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about whom Allah stated in the Quran in Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi indeed Allah and the angels praise the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ya ayyul ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima o you who believe seek Allah's peace and blessings for him what are the characteristics which he displayed for which we should ask Allah's blessings from the Prophet ﷺ, for Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. First and foremost, it is, as we mentioned, the God-conscious character. One who is conscious of God. Meaning that, when we sit and we talk with this individual, no matter what he's talking about. Whether he's talking about fixing his car, buying a house, changing jobs, or as a woman, about the children, the foods that are going to be cooked, per perhaps working also. Whatever they are talking about, Allah is mentioned. Allah's name, Allah's power, Allah's attributes are part and parcel of that conversation. It's worked in there because we don't forget Allah. That is one characteristic. And the person who does this is a person, of course, you, when you speak with them, you can hear the difference between that type of a person and a person who's unconscious of Allah. Most of us, unfortunately, are unconscious of Allah. So when we speak, there is no difference between how we speak and how those who don't even believe in the existence of Allah speak. It's the same. An external observer would say it's the same. No difference between this one and that one. Because that consciousness is not reflected in what we say and what we do. The second characteristic is that of having a stable personality. Stable personality is one which is able to handle the ups and the downs of life. One who handles trials with patience and success with gratitude. Not to say that we don't shake. Yes, we're human beings. Trials will shake us. Success will trick us to some degree. But we're not taken all the way away. Where we lose our way. We are balanced in times of difficulty and times of ease. A balanced personality. When you read about other people who don't have this consciousness of Allah, when trials happen, 
like some years back in the US when there was a <coughs> crash in the stock market. You read articles in the paper, so many stockbrokers jumping out of windows. Suicide. One particular individual they spoke about, this guy had funds of like $5 million. The market dropped, so he only ended up with $1 million. He lost $4 million, and he was jumping out the window. We say, this is somebody who hasn't understood life. No stability in personality. You blame others. And when you can't find others to blame, you blame yourself and take your life. <coughs> One who hasn't understood Allah. Character in this regard is weak, lost. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us character of God consciousness. To make us aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all of the various acts and thoughts and deeds of our lives. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our hearts connected to Him, to keep us conscious of Him, to make our last words in leaving this life remembrance of Him, to keep La ilaha illallah on our tongues, and to keep it in our hearts, and to keep it in our lives. And I ask Allah to give us stability in our individual lives to help us to handle the difficulties and to help us to be uh, thankful to him in the times of blessing and ease. Aqim salah Respect for you the highest of moral character traits. And when Aisha, his wife, radiallahu anha, was asked what was the Prophet's character like? How was his moral character? She said, Kan khuluquhu al Quran. His character was the Quran. All of the, mat the moral attributes which he displayed, they were manifestations of the message of the Quran. He implemented those messages, the messages of revelation, in his day-to-day -day life, in the way that he dealt with his existence. The way that he dealt with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and all misguidance ultimately leads to the hellfire. Brothers and sisters, <clears throat> today we continue our series looking at the pillars of Islam and Iman. But from a moral perspective. As we said, when we began the series looking at the pillars of Islam, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, summarized the essence of the religion from its beginning to its end as a moral message. When he said, Inna ma al-akhlaq. Indeed, I was sent only to perfect Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the last messenger of Allah. Inna asdaq al hadithi kitabullah. Indeed, the most truthful form of speech is the book of Allah. Wa khayra hadi hadyu Muhammadin Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the best source of guidance was the guidance brought by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَشَرَّ الْأُمُورِ مُحْدَثَاتُهَا And the worst of all affairs are the innovations in religion. 
فإن كل محدثة بدعة indeed every innovation in religion is a cursed innovation بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة and every innovation in religion cursed as it is is a source of misguidance وكل ضلالة إن الحمد لله نحمد ونستعين ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله Indeed, all praise is due to Allah, and as such, we should praise Him, seek His help, and seek refuge in Allah from the evil which is within ourselves and the evil which results from our deeds. For whomsoever Allah has guided, none can misguide, and whomsoever Allah has allowed to go astray, none can guide. And I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah. And that Muhammad, the way he dealt with his family, with his children, with his neighbors, with his enemies, in the court, on the battlefield, during Hajj, in his prayers, and how he dealt with the creatures around him in the society, how he treated the animals that he rode, the animals which he had slaughtered for food or for religious rites. All of this was a display of the moral character engendered or taught by the Quran itself. And this was the Sunnah. The Sunnah was the translation of the Qur'an into living.